I've been waiting to get this guest on for a long, long time, gentlemen. He joins us for all two hours. An hour two, we're going to open up the phone lines, 855-711-8255. We'll get the phone number out again. Larry E. Arnold, he got an engineering degree from Lafayette College. He founded Paris Science International in 1976 to pursue the exploration of the Fortean anomalies and consciousness. He is considered the world's leading expert, that's why I got him on, considered the world's leading expert on SHC, otherwise known as spontaneous human combustion. He has authored three pioneering books, The Parapsychological Impact of the Accident at Three Mile Island, Mm. The Reiki Handbook, and of course, Ablaze, The Mysterious Fires of Spontaneous Human Combustion. Larry Arnold, welcome to Earth. How are you? Good evening. Well, fine. Delighted to be with you folks this evening. Larry, I've been, I've been waiting to get you on for a long time. You're on with, of course, my co-host, Double A, and contributor, Scott Hare, and, of course, my producer, The Sentinel. So we're, we all want to ask you questions tonight, Larry. We want to ask you a bunch of questions. W- one thing that I can say, right, right, you know, just for our listeners, they, this is an interesting topic that I've always wanted to cover. How did you discover what you call SHC, and how did you get into it? We were introduced to the phenomenon when we were in junior high school. We spent 35 cents on a paperback book called Stranger Than Science by Frank Edwards. In in that book, which is a compilation of oddities, Fortean phenomena, and just weird occurrences, he had a chapter called uh, Incredible Cremations. And then he, he dealt with the case um, that transpired down in your corner of the country in St. Petersburg, Florida, back in July of 1951, a strange fire death that occurred to Mary Hardy Weezer. And as he described it, it, it captivated our interest and our imagination. And over the years, we would talk to our teachers and our professors in college about it. Had they ever heard of somebody who could, could burn to such an extent that she would be called a cinder woman or a cinder person? And nobody had ever heard of this. Um, when we left college, left our studies in mechanical engineering, we decided to, you know, go back to what we had read about in junior high school to see if this thing that had always stuck in our memory could actually have been happened or had the author of the book simply, you know, made up a, a captivating but completely fictionalized story. We took a weekend, went down to the Library of Congress and went into the microfilm. Back in those days, one used microfilm. And... Um, looked up copies of of the newspapers from St. Petersburg at that time, the St. Petersburg Times and the Tampa Tribune, and found out that Frank Edwards, who introduced us to the subject in our junior high school days, had indeed actually represented this amazing case of Mary Hardy Weiser, who the local papers um, chronicled as front-page news at the time, a woman who had burned up quite mysteriously in a quite localized blaze that had baffled the authorities for many weeks. And that's what launched what we thought was going to be a couple of weeks of study and turned into a four decade long career of investigating anomalous fires around the planet. Wow. Uh, welcome to Earth. Uh, this is Double A speaking, and uh, I definitely wanted to thank you for coming on. Um, my question would be, and obviously you talk about some the parapsychological effects, and, and so my question, I guess we can answer this a little later if that's the direction you're heading, is do you, do you find that these events are more. Um, scientific and that is chemical in nature or spiritual in nature or have you found that they're both and I guess that's that's something to sort of think of uh, down the road um, from a scientific standpoint I do know of people who like swim the, the, the British Channel and their body temperature is lowered to such a point that when they're grabbed by other people to be brought back into the boat they get uh, physical uh, the third the third degree burns on their skin from the skin temperature of others who were just grabbing them. And so what type of combustion are we talking about? Is it, um, uh, is it a boiling? Is it a burning? Is it a flame? Is it different types? That's a very interesting question to begin the discussion of spontaneous human combustion. Uh, we can get into the theories later. There are many of them that we propose. Nothing at this point that we could take into a, into a laboratory and say, you know, here's a theory, let's replicate it, see if we can explain, you know, again and again through repeated experiments just how this phenomenon happens. Uh, we certainly approach the subject scientifically, or so we, we attempt to. We look at the data, we look at the evidence, we look for the, the best evidence possible. 
um, that both history provides us and that the first responders whom we've been um, honored to interview at some of these remarkable fire scenes have, have told us is their firsthand experience in these amazing fire scenes. Um, scientifically, we believe we have convincingly documented the phenomenon as a real event. How to explain it? We get into the realm, obviously, of theorization, hypothesizing, and just scratching our heads sometimes trying, trying to figure it out. It's a very complex, convoluted, and... Um, confabulating topic i want to get i want to get sentinel and scott Hare. everyone wants to ask you questions scotty scott Hare, or sentinel no uh, mr uh, mr arnold uh my name is scott Hare. i'm uh i'm very interested in this because i'm a uh i'm, I'm a contributor to earth but i'm also a I, i've been an active paranormal investigator for 11 years i've been a researcher much longer than that so kind of kind of goes right up my alley as far as stuff that you know, you you have theories on, but but nothing can really be proven. Um, one of the questions one of the questions I had was when is when was the first case of spontaneous human combustion actually uh, uh, re recorded? And from that point to the present, have there been any patterns that 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 you have been able to find? You guys are throwing some really good questions at us right at the <laughs> top of the hour. Yeah. The, okay. the first recorded case we have been able to find in our research that is attributable to the medical literature uh, occurred in the late 1400s or early 1500s. The victim was a knight named Polonus Borstius, and he was said to be drinking um, some spirituous liquors with his buddies, and suddenly he was observed to exhale flame from his mouth succumbed almost immediately to the injuries, to the uh, fiery death that he endured. Um, the medical profession at the time, not surprisingly, hotly debated the case, remarked that there were similar cases they'd heard about um, comparable to what happened to Polonus. When we look at mythology and legends, however, we can trace back descriptions that fit the classic scene of spontaneous human combustion, a.k.a. what happened to Mary Reeser in 1951, uh, as well as two hundreds of others. We can trace accounts that go back several thousands of years. So we believe the phenomenon has been with us for a very, very long time. Medically, as we said, we can trace it back to the late 1400s, early 1500s, and to this day we have several hundred cases that fit the concept of spontaneous human combustion, in which the body is burned, oftentimes, at least in the classic sense, incredibly severely, in a fire scene that is devoid of the kind of heat and flame damage that one expects to find even in a whole building structure fire. So does it burn, I mean, the, the, the way that I kind of, I've always pictured it in my head was that it's almost like the way of like a like a flash of gunpowder would would burn is that kind of you know symbolic of what of what spontaneous human combustion would be I mean it's just a very hot flash kind of fire that just has no chance to really set any of the other combustible materials um, around the person on fire would would that be a good kind of kind of picture to to give yourself that would be a good image to have in some of the cases, though. The, the challenge of this phenomenon and what has been so difficult to research, among many reasons, is that there is no single characteristic or set of circumstances or description of the fire scene that fits all the cases in our database. Um, in, the, in the real classic cases, like Mary Hardy Reeser, Dr. Benley, George Mott, um, we suspect that the event is, as you su suggest, a gunpowder gun flash would be incredibly fast, um, so fast that there is no opportunity for, you know, radiant heat to impact surrounding combustibles that have a much lower kindling point than does the human body. On the other hand, and we can get into this later if you choose, there were survivors and eyewitness cases in which the, the, the instantaneous gunpowder gun powder scenario does not apply. Uh, some of the fires burn very slowly. Many of them, if not all of them, burn without the anticipated um, painful experience that one would, one associates normally with being burned by fire That's something interesting with uh, something interesting with, with the survivor cases uh, and those are very interesting to me as well uh, what are the type of wounds that that the survivors have are they very widespread is is it you know are, are there are there patterns to the to the type of wounds that that that, that survivors uh, would 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 see and I mean what is how <laughs> The, the thing that kind of get, gets me is how do they survive it? I, I, I think that's always been I think that's always been one of the toughest questions is how does one survive and then one 
basically, you know, literally goes up in flames. That is a real challenge to answer, and it's a real challenge to the debunkers of, of spontaneous human combustion, of which there are legion. Um, they tend to ignore the data that we've accumulated, um, having interviewed now dozens of people who have survived partial self-immolation. The gamut, again, is quite extreme. Um, spontaneous human combustion survivors range from experiencing first-degree burns, what happens when you get, uh, you know, um, sunburn, reddening of the epidermis, all the way up to severe third-degree burning in which the, the flesh is charred to the bone. Hmm. Um, and, and by concept and by definition, anybody who has a sunburn is actually a survivor of spontaneous human combustion. Um, you're not near a, a localized, nearby radiant heat source. You've not been exposed to caustic chemicals. You've not been um, standing near a, a radiant radiation source. You've not been exposed to anything that is attributable to a normal burning of the flesh condition. Science in this case believes they know what causes sunburn. It's radiation that you know obviously originates from the sun, but that's 93 million miles away. The more extreme examples of spontaneous human combustion, though beyond sunburn, range in, as we said, from second degree up to third degree severe burning of the of this flesh. The, the first survivor we were actually privileged to interview and to meet with was Jack Angel. And in 1975, he was a traveling salesman down in um, Georgia. He was asleep in his motorhome one night, expecting to meet with a sales client the following morning. He slept through that appointment. When he awakened, he discovered that his right forearm had been charred black, burned to the bone, as he told us, and we had the medical documentation to back that up. And yet the pajamas that he slept in, the sheets on which his body lay during that time, were not burned in any, to any degree whatsoever. Uh, a team of liability lawyers were looking at a big lawsuit against the manufacturer of the motor home in which Jack Angel suffered his injuries, in which he had slept during the, the period in which his body burned to that serious extent. Um, they tore the vehicle literally down to the wheel base looking for, you know, plumbing problems, electrical shorts. They looked at the outside environment. Could he have been struck by lightning? Anything along those lines that came up with zero. Um, had to pull the case from, from the docket um, literally just before going to trial because they could not meet the burden of proof to find any external cause to explain Jack's injuries. In fact, the medical records that we have for Jack's treatment at the Savannah General Hospital afterwards indicate that the burns, according to the attending physicians, were quote-unquote internal in origin. Now, how can you have a burn that is internal in origin other than to say that the burning began within his body and burned outwards to the surface? By definition and by concept, that would be spontaneous human combustion, a severe example of it in which it could be survived. Huh. Wow. 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 wow! So you mean to tell <laughs> us—that's kind of what Jack Angel. So you mean to tell us burn. this wow. man um, fell asleep and woke up with his arm burnt to the bone? That is correct. We have no reason to doubt that. The medical records support it. Uh, the burn to his right forearm was so severe that he elected to have the forearm amputated rather than endure several weeks, if not years of painful reconstructive surgery. He had other attendant burn injuries at that time that caused other biological damage to his body that heretofore he had not experienced. He had fusing of, of, of the disc in the spinal column. He had burns in the nape of his neck and, and his groin area, all of which were unpainful to him at the time that they occurred. As we said, he slept right through the incident initially. Mm. Hmm. The bunkers have, uh, have claimed that we, we, we devote an entire chapter in our book of Blaze to the Jack Angel story. The bunkers have claimed, well, Jack clearly couldn't have spontaneously combusted because, Larry, we all know that spontaneous human combustion is an absolute absurdity. It cannot happen, so therefore there must be a known external cause. And they usually invoke that uh, Jack Angel had stepped out of his motor home mm. to twiddle with the um, plumbing and scalded himself with hot water from the motor home's plumbing unit. Well, we spoke to a number of, of service technicians who dealt with that particular brand of Avco motorhome. We've actually looked at, at, at the, a model of the motorhome that Jack slept in. We've examined the plumbing. We've talked, as we said, to the experts who deal with repairing such systems. And to a person, we are told that plumbing cannot explain the kind of burns that Jack experienced. Besides, if he had scalded himself with water, they would have been external, externally induced burns, obviously. And the physicians would not 
have ever come up with a diagnosis that the burns were internal in origin. Clearly, they would have said these are scalding hot water burns from the, you know, burn from the outside. So, you know, the medical testimony, the analysis of the, of the fire scene, and the testimony of the attorneys involved in the case, both of whom we interviewed extensively in their office down in um, Atlanta, Georgia, all attest to the fact that the best evidence leads to the best conclusion that Jack Angel suffered from and survived the incredibly rare phenomenon of spontaneous human combustion, and he lived to tell about it. Almost every, almost every incident that I've heard, um, that, and, and there's not many uh, that, that are online, they're, they're very few and far between, it seems. Almost every incident of, of this phenomenon I've ever heard involves the, the victim sleeping or, or the victim being in bed. Is that, is that what is? Is that the same with a great percentage of them that, that you noticed throughout the years that you've been able to, to, to record and look at? Or, or is it widespread that they could be standing or, or doing whatever? Um, the research says basically they can, do, they can be doing whatever. Um, the only human activity that we have been able to identify so far that is commonplace, commonly experienced, commonly acted upon, that does not raise its head in the field of spontaneous human combustion is, shall we, shall we delicately say, amorous activity. Excluding that, people have been walking, standing, sitting in a chair watching television, um, apparently having a meal, um, sitting in a boat in the middle of a lake, uh, when the body can spontaneously ignite. You know, it's interesting about the arguments of the debunkers is that they seem unscientific and circular to say that <laughs> this can't happen because it just can't. It becomes a circular argument, whereas it seems like you're actually doing actual scientific work. And what's one of the, the least appreciated or understood things about people who do investigative work is you may not necessarily have the answer, but neither does the other guy. But at least you're not making circular arguments, so I can definitely uh, appreciate your scientific approach to it to at least try to explain. To first, gather the facts to make sure that this is a real case, and then from that point, try to understand it. So I, I like it. Let, let, me, let me speak up for Larry real quick, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you just did right there in a lot of ways. When, when I first heard Larry Arnold interviewed, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to – because this is just after – Larry, you know, recently a case – I forget where, where where the guy was at, but he was walking and basically caught on fire while he was walking. It was just very fairly recent, um, and you you looked into it and instead of saying, "Oh yeah, that was that was SHC," you you, know, you looked into it and and you said live on air on on the interview that you were on, you you said no, it, it was not spontaneous human combustion. You know, so he he's not looking for everything to be SHC. He right. he's, he's doing real investigative work, and there we we got about T minus four minutes before this first break. But when we come back from the first break, I want I want to get into more cases, more cases with you. We got a bunch of questions to ask you, but I, I just wanted to give you those those kudos right there. And we certainly appreciate that from both of you gentlemen um, very much. Um, we've been called a mystery monger by some of our debunkers. The, the phenomenon doesn't need mongering. It's, it's a mystery in and of itself. And as we said at the top of the interview, we, we tried desperately to conduct our research in all fields of the paranormal um, with a scientific, open-minded attitude. Um, as we say, we look for the best evidence, and we look for the facts as best as we can ascertain them to be, and we follow where the facts lead us. That's what? been the core of our research and everything that we do for decades. Larry, Larry Arnold, are you back with us, my friend? Yes, we're here. When we left off, I, I think, uh, was it Scott Hare that was delving into a direction? Well, I could delve into it. I have many directions I can delve. I'm, I'm ready to dive anywhere if you want me to. Delve on. Let, 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 let me do this. Let, let me, let me, let me hijack one of your directions and then give it. No, right, go ahead. And then give it yeah, right. Yeah, go ahead. And then I'm going to give it right back to you. You and I were talking privately, Scotty, because you, you've in many of your paranormal investigations, the whole scratching, people being scratched. Mm hmm And and you, so you had your own theory thus far of how that happens when people are scratched by, well, ghosts or whatever. 
but how, how does that you, you you tied that into you wanted to ask larry about your theory well i've you know through through my years i've 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 experienced many things that with the many investigations i've been on i've been on some very nasty cases as well where you know you have actual physical uh manipulation going on where you thrown being thrown being hit being scratched and the one that uh the one that i focus on when when the when the topic of spontaneous human combustion comes up is being scratched because when i thought about it the one um the one thing that any investigator talks about or anybody who is in that house any of the clients talk about is the fact that they feel a burning sensation uh, when when they are actually scratched. They don't feel the physical kind of ripping of the skin. What they feel is a burning sensation. Then you see the actual scratch manifest. My my idea behind it, when I think about spontaneous human combustion, is 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 it possible that within the paranormal, a spirit is when scratching or when manipulating, pulling hair. Or, or any any of those possible things to provoke, is it possible that they're somehow uh, actually manipulating your electromagnetic field to make your body kind of kind? I, I, I guess it would be attack itself because um, it, you know that's it's 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 a hypothesis that I've that I've kind of thought about as I as I've as I've gone through my investigations be, because you know a. A spirit can't just grab you. It doesn't have a way to physically provoke, you know, to physically grab you or to physically throw something at you or to physically scratch you. It has to have another way to do it. And with it being energy, I thought the electromagnetic field of another person would be the way to actually be able to attack. And I, I, I was wondering, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, very provocative. Uh, certainly we're well beyond what, what can be taken into the laboratory by mainstream science at this present time. Obviously, yes. Yeah. We, we, we do, in our book, discuss um, briefly the possibility of what, what, what folklorists call fire spirits, Agni, Vitu, the Vitu, uh, which is a folklore tradition coming out of South Africa, uh, which may have some relevance to some recent poltergeist-type fire cases there. Um, what we will address is your, your linkage to the phenomenon, be it um, paranormal scratches or spontaneous human combustion, to the bioelectrical energy of the individual. We believe that most, if not all, of the cases that come under the moniker of spontaneous human combustion can certainly be better explained, not as an oxidizing type of combustion, what happens when you strike a match, for example, but as a bioelectrical, biomagnetic, bioplasma type phenomenon. So whether the spirit, is, as, as in the cases that you're alluding to, invoke and work with the individual's bioelectrical field we can't say with certainly, but it's certainly worthy. It's a it's a worthy avenue we would suggest to pursue further. You, you know what, Larry? I, I see. I, when I was talking to Scott Hare earlier this week, I I said, you know, listen, I don't know exactly. Obviously, it's just been a subject that I've been interested in. And I always thought maybe it was some type of mishap chemically within within the human body, and and I think Scott Hare is kind of onto something that you're agreeing with. We would agree. Um, certainly the, the, the human body is a cauldron of complex chemical reactions, and again, we can look at biochemistry as a means to explain some cases of spontaneous human combustion. One of the dilemmas of many in the research that we've done with this topic is that, as we said earlier, the cases are so varied, so diverse in their presentation, that so far, at least for us, it's been impossible to come up with a single theory, one single plausible explanation that, that can um, find applicability to all the cases. That's why we believe we're dealing with a phenomenon that, in its end result, provides a similar set of situations to confront, uh, i.e. in the classic cases of pile of ash and debris, uh, with perhaps part of a leg, uh, a forearm left to say that that pile of ash once belonged to a living human being. But beyond that, we're you know we're wide open to to exploring a wide gamut of plausible explanations for the phenomenon. We do not believe there's a single explanation for all the hundreds of cases in our database. If there is, um, please talk to us because somebody's much more brilliant than we are. Not that that can't certainly happen. So now, as we get into possible solutions, 
or possible uh, causes before we even get into solutions. Uh, have you heard of PACS, P-A-C-T-S? It's, it's the uh, People Against Covert Torture and Surveillance International, um, and what people believe themselves to be targeted individuals, and uh, they formed us an international society. And the reason I bring this up is because as far as what percentage do you think could be um, uh, you know, directed energy weapons? Obviously, this happened before. Uh, this has been going on before the directed energy weapons were a thing. But microwaves can certainly, uh, you know, do the same type of things, especially if they're aimed, whether it's from satellites or from certain type of microwave guns. And, and, and like you said, the, the, the complex uh, array of chemicals in the human uh, skin, maybe in the proximity to uh, uh, different types of electromagnetic radiation. What portion of that do you think uh, could be a new phenomenon uh, that comes from that type of uh, targeting, if it exists? Ed, that's, that's a new neck, a new acronym to us. We're not aware of that organization until now. Um, as to what percentage could be attributable to directed energy, militarized weapons yes. that, that could lead to spontaneous combustion, we say the percentage is extraordinarily small. Okay. We are not rule it out. We do have cases in a book where people have been burned by radar units, which emit microwave radiation. We have a case mm -hmm. of a hang glider who was spontaneously burned because he flew into the path. He glided into the path of the PayPal radar units on Cape Cod. Okay. But as you rightly point out, the, many of the cases significantly predate, you know, this kind of high-tech weaponry. Yes, the military does have directed energy weapons that can cause debilitate the target at a distance due to either sonic waves or microwave projected radiation. Um, these are portable units. They do exist. But again, uh, when it comes to SHC, um, the places in which the cases occur, the dates on which they have happened, uh, go well beyond the ability to attribute most, if not all, of the cases to directed energy weapon explanation. Okay. What about um, what about going along the same line of, of AA? What about a introduction of a chemical agent uh, to somehow to the body or to the bloodstream? Could that uh, is is there any plausibility to that with with, with some of the cases you've researched? Again, we can't rule it out. We don't have the security clearance that will allow us with any degree of um, insight to, to, to go significantly deep into any answer to that. Um, on a flight back from doing a television program in, in, in California many years ago, uh, we were discussing the subject with a seatmate, and he clearly worked for the government in high-level clearance type of research, and he hinted to us that the government did know about spontaneous human combustion and definitely commented that we needed to look further into that angle, but again, we lack the, the necessary security clearance, clearances to go very far in that direction. So if somebody listening has those security clearances and wants to, <laughs> wants to um, you know, hint, hint, hint at us, we're happy to hear from them. <laughs> has, um, are, are, are any of the remains of any, any of the, the SHC victims that you studied still, still around anywhere? And is, if, if possible to get those remains, is there any possibility of getting DNA off them? Ah, very interesting question about the DNA. As far as the remains themselves, um, we know we know the burial places of a few of the the more recent victims. Mary Hardy Reeser, for example, much to our astonishment when we discovered this, her ashen remains, which consisted of a few pounds of calcined vertebrae, um, a foot, and what was said to be a, a skull that shrank to the size of a teacup or orange. Uh, those remains are interred at, at a cemetery just south of Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, which is about 10 miles from our office here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, we've never been given the opportunity to have those remains interred, and frankly, I think legally it would be very difficult to do that. The remains of Dr. John Irving Bentley, another classic case of spontaneous human combustion, in fact, the one that really captivated our interest and, and launched us on a new scientific career. Um, his remains are buried up in Galton, uh, Pennsylvania, not too far from where he self-immolated in Cowder's Port back in 1966. Again, going through the legal nice, uh, requirements to access the the, the, the the burial contents of those victims is probably beyond our budget and interest at this point to pursue. Not sure it would be fruitful. Um, 
amazingly, some of the victims who, who whose bodies burn in a localized fire to the extent that the, the bodies were burned more completely, more thoroughly, that can be accomplished under the best scientifically known conditions in a crematorium retort, their ashen remains were either recremated and and um, or otherwise, you know, tossed tossed in the air, um, buried at sea, whatever. Hmm. Um, That's interesting. Um, it, have um, of, of any of the victims have there been autopsies on them? And I guess the question would be. We're, we're all made up, of course, of different minerals and different elements. Are there any elements of these remains that are missing, that 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 should be there but are not? Uh, another great question. You guys are doing wonderful tonight. These are the kinds of questions that we like to be hearing from professional firefighters rather than, oh, spontaneous human combustion is a myth, a fancy fairy tale, <laughs> a superstition of medieval ages that uh, we, we don't need to long, long ago contend with because it doesn't happen. Um, the point on autopsies is very, very interesting. Um, the only case that presently comes immediately to mind in which an autopsy was conducted, and well, there were two actually, and, and the, we know the results. Uh, the first case happened uh, to Beatrice Oski in 1979 out of Bolingbroke, Illinois. The results of that toxicology was that there was not a drop of blood left in her body. This is not quite the classic case of spontacom. Um, there was quite a a large amount of her anatomy left in the chair in which she otherwise locally burned up. Um, but to find in the amount of biological material uh, and the amount of physiology that she left behind, not a drop of blood um, is itself, we think, quite remarkable and intriguing. Hmm. As to the rest of the autopsies in general, um, we have death certificates for, for Dr. Bentley, we have death certificates for George Mott, a retired fireman who immolated in his bed in upstate New York back in the spring of 1986. In both of those death certificates, the, the cause of death, death is attributable first to asphyxiation. Well, in order to ascertain asphyxiation as a cause of death, to the best of our knowledge, you need a trachea, esophagus, or in the lungs, none of which were present in either case. Those death certificates then go on to say that beyond asphyxiation, the, the, the victim suffered, um, you know, advanced burning or advanced charring. In both cases, again, the bodies were not charred, they were ashened, uh, leaving behind, in, in the case of Dr. Bentley, a lower, one, lower part of one leg. In the case of George Mott, similar, his lower left leg was left intact on the, on the mattress through which the rest of his body cremated. And, and so, some, and you know, some, asking about autopsies is certainly a worthy area to pursue. Unfortunately, you know, the, the accuracy of the autopsies that have been allegedly done and reported on death certificates as legal documents representing supposed facts of the situation are, are clearly not reliable when it comes to cases of spontaneous human combustion. Larry, real quick, I, I was just trying to get in. A lot of times, you, you, also the remains, are, you know, as you said, organs are gone a, a foot, but a, a, or part of a C spine, right? Correct. Go ahead, Scotty. I, I, I stepped on you. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm interested where you're going with this. No, I'm, I'm just bringing up the fact we're, we're going to hit this break in, in oh, just okay, a moment. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I get, I get where you're going. Um, well, in in one of the cases, you said the blood was missing. Correct. Um, what, w what was the condition? Because I've heard in some cases the vital organs were 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 not damaged. What if 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 all the blood was missing? What was the condition of the heart? Was was the heart still intact, or or was it was it completely charred? In the Oski case, we we we're not qualified to answer that. We don't know that detail. Um, okay. In a in a case that the most recent case that that we know of that will stake our reputation and research upon happened in 2013 in Oklahoma. Um, the victim was Danny Van Zandt. In that case, we again have the autopsy reports and 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 extensive interviews with the first responders in that case. In in the in the episode involving Danny Van Zandt, his heart indeed was left intact. It was severely burned, but identifiable as the heart, as was the body from the shoulders up. From the, the mid-shoulders down, excluding the heart, um, the next part of his anatomy found at the fire scene were his feet and upper ankles. All other internal organs have been damaged, have been destroyed. And if we can squeeze this in just before the break, great. If not, hit us on this afterwards. One of the debunkers who, who says that we 
cannot consider spontaneous human combustion is because he claims, this is a forensic biologist, Dr. Mark Benecki, he says, even intestines, stomach, liver, heart, uterus, bladder, etc., in other words, all internal organs are well preserved, even in the most severe burn cases. He adds that there are, in the forensic practice, no known cases in which internal organs of a burned corpse were damaged more severely than the outer parts, end quote. On that basis, he contends that spontaneous human combustion has never occurred because there was never a case in which internal organs are more damaged than external body parts. Larry, that Larry, is Larry, simply not true. Larry, hold on right there, my brother. We'll be back. Short segment on the other side. This is Earth. Larry Arnold, our guest for tonight's program, world's leading expert into SHC, otherwise known as spontaneous human combustion. Larry, it's a really short segment right here before we hit our hard break to begin the second hour. So I want to give it over to Double A. You, you have a question real quick. It, in, in hour two, I definitely want to bring up a lot of cases with you, Larry, and to, for, so you can describe those in depthly. But Double A or Scott Hare or, or Sentinel? I'm good. I just wanted to thank you for coming out on the show and definitely want to make sure you, you, you plug your, uh, all of your information. So I might schmooze you for a book uh, with, with an autograph. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> okay. I've got a, a question here real quick, and I'm, I'm okay. sure it'll be a quick answer to it. Uh, it's called spontaneous human combustion for a reason, obviously. But is there any cases involving some other kind of animal or something like that other than human beings mm. that, uh, that might have suffered the same fate? Yes, we devote a few pages in our book of Blaze to SAC, spontaneous animal combustion. With cases occurring, um, witness cases in some instances to dogs, cats, uh, livestock, um, like going the, up in balls of blue wow. light, blue flame, if you will. Mm. Um, and as many of the cases that have been witnessed in, in terms of humans suddenly igniting into flame, the color there most often reported being observed um, is also a bright blue hue. The, the kind of intense blue that you, you see at the, the tip of a, of a lit acetylene torch, for example. Wow, interesting. Cause, um, it's, and, and does that cross over into, like, the animal mutilation thing uh, where, where people get all weird and they t start talking about UFOs and all that kind of stuff? So th th does that stuff cross over? Does mutilation uh, include burning, or is, it, is that a different subject altogether? Well, with cattle mutes, um, yes, you know, um, the best evidence or the best information that we have in that field, that's not an area that we specialize in, but those who do that, we, that are colleagues of ours, talk about the, the burns being, or the, the injuries to the animals having cauterized burning out their edges. So it appears that a high heat source is involved, but we would not link that directly to cases of spontaneous animal or spontaneous human combustion. Cool. So they're two, two separate phenomena. Good to know. We believe so. Awesome. Cattle, cattle mutilation has always been very, very, as far as in my research, very, very a surgical situation. Very, mm. very surgical, right. as Larry said, and everything's cauterized. So ah. it's, you know, you know, far different. But I, t I tell you, it's amazing. Larry, Larry Brooklyn, we're going to hit this break, but and we'll talk about it in the second hour. But in these cases... With, with the victims of spontaneous human combustion. And by the way, what a great question by Sentinel right there. Do animals. That was good. That was too cool for school. Lead, this, lead, lead, lead everyone in as we go to break, Larry. A lot of these cases, these victims of spontaneous human combustion, there's a sweet smell, and we'll talk about it later on. There is indeed, and we'll be happy to explore that with you guys at the top of the next hour. Perfect. Perfect. Larry Arnold is our guest tonight, folks. Second hour of tonight's transmission. It's Saturday night, February 17, 2018 or 2018, as you like it. Larry Arnold is our guest, folks. You're going to hear how to get all of his information a little bit later on in tonight's program. Also also with us, of course, is our great c contributor, Scott Hare, asking some brilliant questions tonight. Executive producer, The Sentinel, and my co-host, Double A. Larry some of these cases, uh, if if you want to, I'd love to delve into some of these cases in depthly. You, you started off with the Cinder Woman, which which was the Re the Reese case, and you've mentioned some others. What, what's a what's a case that you you can delve into in depthly to to explain 
you know, it's going to be graphic for people, but to explain what we're actually looking at. Because I, I said the sweet smell when we went to break. Right. We are, we are happy to do that. We certainly can do that. And a great place to start um, in answering that would be to bring up the case of, jo- of Dr. John Irving Bentley that we alluded to in the first hour. While Mrs. Reza was our introduction to the phenomenon, it was, it was the demise of Dr. Bentley, his baffling, burning death, that really captivated our curiosity and, and basically got us hooked uh, for decades into tracking down evidence for this amazing and often denied phenomenon. We had the privilege of meeting with most of the first responders, um, the coroner involved in the case, the the deputy coroner, um, the newspaper editor who covered the case of Dr. Banley's death as a front page story uh, for the Potter Enterprise back in December of 1966. We're going to walk you through the story, if we may, as as if you or your listeners are are Don Gosnell. Don Gosnell is a volunteer fireman at the time in in northern Pennsylvania in the town of Cowdersport, county seat of Potter County. And he was the one who literally walked into the fire scene. So imagine you're Don Gosnell. Um, You're in good health. You're waking up on a Monday morning, specifically December 5, 1966, when the weather was very much then like it is right now here in Harrisburg. We've got several inches of snow on the ground. It's pretty cold outside. You're lacing up your work boots. Your job is to read gas meters for the, the West Penn Gas Company. You put on your gloves, coat, go down the street, pick up the meter book at, at the gas office, and proceed your rounds Monday morning. You get to 403 North Main Street in Cowdersport. It's the home of Dr. Bentley. It's a wooden structure. Dr. Bentley is the only occupant of the house at the time. The front door is unlocked. People did not lock their doors in Cowdersport back in 1966. You walk in, go down the hallway, and yell a happy good morning greeting to Dr. Bentley as you walk down the hallway past his two-room apartment. You don't get a response. No big deal. You continue down the hallway, make a right turn, proceed down the basement steps, Read the gas meter down there in the basement. As you're turning to go back upstairs, you notice on a corner of the earthen floor a pile of ashes about five inches in height, 14 inches in diameter. As Don Gosnell, you're also a volunteer firefighter. You walk over to that pile of ash. You're curious. Something must have burned here. Wonder what it could be. You kick it with your work boot. Where did the ashes come from? You look overhead. There's a two-by-three-foot hole in the basement ceiling. A couple cherry red embers on the perimeter of that hole. You think to yourself, as Don Gosnell told us he thought to himself at that time, hmm, something must have burned here overnight. Wonder why we didn't get a call at the fire department to respond. You go back upstairs, and now you notice again a a grayish-white smoke in the hallway and a sweet odor in the hallway. Before you leave Dr. Bentley's home, you yell out your second greeting that morning to old Doc, wish him well, but get no response. You decide to check in on Dr. Bentley because his apartment door, like the front door of his house, is unlocked. You open the door and peer in. You know that Dr. Bentley lives in a two-room apartment consisting of a sitting room and an adjoining small bathroom. You don't see Dr. Bentley in the sitting room. Or maybe old Doc, who's 92 and and in presumably good health but aged, you know, is in the bathroom. You, You step into the apartment, peer around the corner into Dr. Bentley's bathroom and see a hole in the floor with what you first think is the leg of a mannequin lying on the linoleum flooring. You think, why would Dr. Bentley have a mannequin leg in his apartment bathroom floor? You peer down to look closer and suddenly realize it's not a mannequin's leg, but it's a human leg. And then you realize where the ashes in the basement came from. You run out of the house down the street and into your guest's office and yell the understatement of 1966. Dr. Bentley's burned up. Hmm. Indeed, he had, but in a way that made no sense to Don Gosnell as a, as a volunteer firefighter, made no sense to the deputy coroner, made no sense to the coroner. It made no sense to anybody. Dr. Bentley's legacy, if you will, to the world of fire science is one half of one leg and a pile of dry, ashen powder that the night before had belonged to his approximately 175, 180-pound body. Now weighed less than three pounds, the leg excluded. We were at the fire scene after some reconstruction had been done, but largely the fire scene was intact when we got there 10 years later. 
the hole in the floor had been patched, but we were down in the basement. We could see that the oaken beams, the supports for the flooring, had almost been burned completely through. It takes a tremendous amount of heat for a very long time to burn through nine-inch oaken beam braces. The linoleum in Dr. Bentley's uh, flooring was old tar-based stuff, highly flammable material. Beyond that two-by-three-foot hole through which his body immolated, the linoleum floor was intact. Dr. Bentley used an aluminum walker to help him locomote through the apartment. The aluminum walker was lying askew above the hole. The aluminum, which melted 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, was completely intact, save for two rubber tips on his legs that had been blown off. Directly above one edge of the hole was Dr. Bentley's bathtub. The bathtub had paint on it. It was enamel paint, not baked porcelain. We were at the fire scene, and we can attest that the paint on the edge of the bathtub was blackened by carbonization. The paint did not blister. Dr. Bentley's bathroom ceiling was low. We're six feet tall. We could outstretch our hand and touch the ceiling. There was not a scorch mark, a heat mark, any distortion, any discoloration, any damage to the ceiling above the hole through which Dr. Bentley's body burned it down. Dr. Bentley burned it down, not up. And as you remarked before the, uh, the the break at the top of the hour, and as we think we said, if not, we'll say it now, Don Gosnell noticed a sweet, redolent perfume-like aroma at the fire scene. Again, quite atypical of a fire scene of, of normal conditions where there is burned flesh present. As we said, Dr. Bentley's official cause of death was asphyxiation, according to the death certificate filed here in Pennsylvania. That simply is not true. How can you? No, how? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. How could how could how could the uh, coroner list cause of death as asphyxiation? There was no trachea, no esophagus, no lungs. All internal organs were completely destroyed. Mark Benecki, pay attention. By your own qualifications to dismiss SHC, the case of Dr. Bentley alone proves the validity that spontaneous human combustion is by concept and by definition an event that must come, that officials in the fire science and the medical communities must come to terms with. That is Dr. Bentley's legacy to the world. Wow. So speaking of coming to terms, are there professional fire people who have uh, supported you or come to terms uh, with uh, you know, spontaneous human con- combustion, or, or at least uh, don't rule it out as a possibility. Yes, blessedly they are, but they are almost as rare as is the phenomenon itself. Mm. Here in Harrisburg, Don Conkle, who used to be the city fire chief, now retired. He continues to teach fire science at the local community college. Bless his heart, he has us come in every year since the book was published in 1996 to teach a special course to his fire science students about the unusual, extreme, weird side of fire behavior. Um, In in the Van Zandt case from Oklahoma in 2013, Sheriff Lockhart was open to the concept of spontaneous combustion as a retired arson investigator before he was elected sheriff of Sequoia County. He knew what he should find at a fire fatal fire scene in the case of Van Zandt. What he found belied everything that his years in arson investigation and training as a fire investigator told him he should be looking at. He was looking at something very different. Uh, Rick Russell, the fire chief for the the first responding fire company in the the Van Zandt case, also um, is willing to, so far as we still know, uh, support the premise of spontaneous human combustion as the best explanation for the demise of Danny Van Zandt. His fire, again, was a very localized fire scene. As we said earlier, um, Mr. Van Zandt left behind his upper shoulders, the head, his heart, um, a short segment of his backbone, and then we get down to his feet and ankles. And the rest of the internal organs, pancreas, liver, lungs, all decimated, unrecognizable, damn it, you know, just, just burned up. They just were not present and identifiable as those organs. No damage to the ceiling overhead, minimal damage to the refrigerator against which the body itself burned. The fire, again, as as Chief Russell told us, began with and ended at the body. Mm. And this is what we hear again and again from from those fire officials who have been at these remarkable, but as we want to emphasize, also extremely rare fire scenes. If they are being honest, when they are being honest, um, 
they are left with a mystery that they are ill-prepared to grapple with because their fire science training has not prepared them to realize that such fire scenes can and do occur. Wow, and that, that got, was getting me into my next question, because the NFPA, right, the National Fire Protection Agency or Association, mm-hmm. uh, the, the NFPA 921 is the Bible for investigating all fires and explosions, which for some reason was not used on 9-11, but I digress. <laughs> Um, but uh, it's, it's, it, it is the Bible. And so are there principles in that that can be used and applied to studying these cases? Or is it safe to say that there's absolutely nothing mentioned in the NFPA 921 about these particular kind of cases? Can you comment about that? You know your material. Excellent. Uh, congratulations. Yes, we have a copy of 921. We don't think it's the current edition, but the edition that we do have does not speak to spontaneous human combustion fire scenes. Uh, we did contact years ago in the early stages of our research, uh, NFPA, looking for their assistance. Um, didn't get it. Mm. Sentinel or Scotty Hare, you guys want to jump in? I'm just, uh, <clears throat> I'm actually, uh, if I think if I have this right, I'm looking at actually John Irving's uh the photograph of of the, of the area in the bathroom, and it's 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 amazing, you know how how he was describing it because it's basically spot on, and it's just amazing how there's just the there's there's the there's the carbon charring almost around around the hole, but nothing around the hole seems to be damaged. It's you know, it's it's I. I can't even explain it. I mean, there there seems there's a basket on on the uh, on on the walker, and and mm-hmm. the, the the small aluminum on the basket isn't even doesn't even look to be warped. You're um, quite correct. Yep, you're looking at the photograph. That photograph was given to us by the photographer. Mm-hmm. Um, he said he would never publish it. We could do with it as we chose. It's copyrighted, and it it is it it represents the quintessential classic fire scene that history has labeled. Perhaps unfortunately, but the term is stuck as spontaneous human combustion. For those debunkers, naysayers, fire scientists who find that phrase just too disquieting, too discomforting to deal with, we've proposed a different moniker for these fire scenes, such as Dr. Bentley's. We call it um, super hypothermic carbonization. We still get to keep the acronym SHC. Um, <laughs> it, it, it demands that fire scientists add a new category to burn injury classification. When we began our research, there were three, there were three, there were three classes of burns, first, second, third degree. First degree, as we said earlier, was, is a sunburn. Second degree was when the epidermis is blistered. Third degree was basically everything else, what it was called severe charring. Since our research began, they've added a fourth classification of burn injury, which is deep char, um, where, where, where Burn damage can get down into, you know, muscle tissue itself. In whole structure of fires, when the house, when the building burns down around the, the fire fatality, invariably you can pick up that body intact, take it to a morgue, and as you said earlier, it can be autopsied. We can find the cause of death because usually there's, you know, the trachea is left. We can say, yep, this person asphyxiated, he was not murdered, it's not a victim of foul play. Um, even people who specialize in taphonomy, the, the science of dealing with the effects of fire injury to human bodies, um, the assertion is made that you can always find evidence of foul play in the burned remains of the victim, stab wounds, gunshot wounds, etc. In extreme burn cases, which would be in our classification, a fifth-degree burn injury, i.e. Mary Weezer, Dr. Bentley, Mr. Van Zandt, and scores and scores of others. This requires a new burn classification because these burn injuries, as you're describing the Dr. Bentley photograph, far exceed a fourth-degree burn injury. Mm. And you will not find at these fire scenes evidence of stab wounds or gunshot wounds or any other you know, criminal act. There is just not enough of a body left to ascertain the presence of such foul play if indeed it occurred. In the research case, it was alluded to, well, yes, she was burned off-premises, and the criminal brought the ashes that he burned of Mrs. Reeser from some other location back into her apartment and sold her the scene. That's preposterous. That makes no criminal sense to us whatsoever. But so extreme and so perplexed were the, was, so extreme was the burn scene, and so perplexed were the individuals that they were actually willing to consider silly scenarios like that rather than grapple with the possibility that Murray Reeser died by spontaneous human combustion. 
Now, the, the hole either sounds like something uh, st- straight out of a scene from the alien movies with the with the blood that that was acid that would go through floors or whatever. But also, uh, what I'm thinking the the way you describe these burns would they be similar to something like, for example, people who have lightning strikes or something like that, where maybe their insides would get cooked and and maybe uh, an electric spark that came down, uh, you know, lightning style would would that uh, you know what do you think as far as um, how does that compare to something like that our familiarity with lightning strike victims and we've spoken to some of them um we know we know Rory, Rory sullivan who i think still holds the world record for having been struck nine times by lightning before he finally met his physical transition by means other than lightning lightning strike victims do not exhibit the kind of burn pattern or burn injuries that we find in classic spontaneous human combustion fire scenes we're dealing with something quite different mm. And and so not a lightning and so would you say electric fence if somebody just grabbed a really super high powered electric fence or whatever would that be a different kind of burn uh, that that you would see with a lightning or similar? It would be a different kind of burn again, um, and we'll we'll offer this caveat. There's a corollary phenomenon that almost nobody knows anything about or has even heard of. It's called preternatural combustibility. If you go to the medical texts in the 17 and 1800s. Uh, pre-1850, uh, when the medical community, if you will, hotly debated the subject of whether or not SHC really occurred, um, they had a corollary phenomena called preternatural combustibility, which is this. The body would burn severely, more completely than we would expect to find, even coming out of a retort cremation oven, um, but burn and comparably to what we call um, classic spontaneous human combustion fire scenes, but in the case of preternatural combustibility, there is a known external ignition source, i.e., a person would would, um, strike a match, drop it on his or her lap, or touch an electrical wire, as you're suggesting, and then there's something aberrantly unusual biochemically or bioelectrically in that particular person's body that is not mainstream, that is quite out of the ordinary, that once externally ignited or struck by lightning or electricity, then the body biochemically or bioelectrically burns far more ferociously and completely than one normally expects to have happen. That gets you away from spontaneous human combustion, but then it raises another quandary. What are those chemical or bioelectrical conditions that made that person once in contact with an external known ignition source burn up so completely? The human body normally is very, very difficult to cremate, to burn. Um, the body is 75 to 80 percent water, and the reason firemen use water is because it extinguishes the heat of combustion. Um, so when a body has that much water in it, when a substance has that much water in it, it's really hard for people to wrap their brain around the fact that, given all that water, how can it burn so completely? Is that, but it does. There's actually something you said. Mr. Arnold, that I, I I just actually thought of, and I wanted to ask. I'm, I'm kind of putting things together in my head, and this is kind of the way I work. I just kind of brainstorm things. And um, there's two places. Well, there's a couple places in the body where you could have some kind of uh, you know, where 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 there is a, a basically an electrical an an electrical signal mm-hmm. that 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 triggers something. And the one thing you said to me was that the blood was gone. And I was thinking of the heart. The heart has the SA and the AV node. I mean, this is my medical terminology coming out, which 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 causes the the heart to pump. And you were saying that there are, you know, that that, that there very well could be certain conditions within a body that that could, that could very very possibly start this back in the 1850s when the I can't say the term again, but I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember it. But um, there are certain conditions within within the human heart as far as with the heart's with 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 the heart's pacing that that are different in certain people like me i i actually have a i actually have a a heart rate that is actually different than than everybody else's i'm i'm like i i'm i'm only part of like 30% of the population has it or something like that so that that actually uh that actually just came into my mind that you know mm. they, you were saying back in the 1850s they they thought that these special circumstances within the, within the human body could cause it and all of a sudden that popped into my head <laughs> mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I yeah, so so yeah, I just um I don't know, I just had like a realization that 
I don't know. I, 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 I don't even know how to. I don't even know how to react to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, that reminds me of, of blood types. Is there a pattern uh, with blood types, like O negative or AB negative being the rarest in the world? That's me, O negative. Right. We we have no way to answer that. Um, this is not um, blood yeah. typing is not part of a normal fire incident report, so mm. that information simply is not available to right. us. Well, the funny part with the human body, too, though, is I mean, it is it is predominantly made up of water, but we are also made up of car- carbon and a bunch of other elements. I mean, technically, parts you know you you could take certain parts of the body and make gunpowder. So so I mean, you know, there there, there are there are. There, there are elements and, and chemicals in the body that that could that could definitely explode, and with the cert, with certain conditions, depending on where that spark happens, you know, it's very possible that in the 1850s they were very very much could have been onto something. Not having the medical knowledge we have today, that's that's correct. Um, that's why we we've, we've, we've gone back into the history of this subject and, and pulled out um, from dusty tomes and, and medical libraries. Uh, volume after volume that contains references to both individual cases and to the hey, Larry, speculation and the thinking that was being done by, by medicine at that time. It's quite fascinating. Who, is, who are the debunkers mainly and who have been attacking this? Oh, God, we've spent the last, hour, last half hour of the program just enumerating the debunkers. They're legion. Um, there's John DeHaan, a, a renowned forensic uh, specialist out on the West Coast in California. There's Joe Nickel, associated with, with what used to be called the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, PSYCHOP. I think now they call themselves CSI. Um, there's Mark Benecki that we cited earlier, a, a lecturer in forensic sciences both in the United States and in Germany. Um, there's the, the Dame of Flame, uh, who's name at the moment sadly eludes us, uh, but she, she's a specialist in taphonomy, and as we said earlier, um, one of her contentions against SHC is that there were always enough of the body parts left that you can ascertain stab wounds, foul play, gunshot wounds, as we said in the case of Mary Weezer, Dr. Bentley, and scores of other cases, simply a statement and a claim that is unsupportable. The, the debunkers usually, if not invariably, will invoke the, the human wick theory to explain away, um, or in their view, to explain uh, cases of alleged spontaneous human combustion. And the theory is basically that the body once ignited externally by a dropped cigarette, an arson murderer, or a carelessly toss, tossed match, will suddenly become an inverted candle on which the garment of the victim becomes the wick, uh, the body's adipose tissue becomes analogous to the candle tallow, and over many, many hours the body slowly emulates in a low heat combustion that reduces the body completely to powder. Well, if that were indeed the case, we would argue that every crematorium operator in the world would not be investing $100,000 in a retort, mechanical lifts, cremulators to grind up powder that comes out of the retort oven uh, before giving it to the next of kin. They would simply buy a pack of cigarettes and get a free pack of match, a pack of cigarettes and buy a, get a free pack of matches from the local bank. Uh, light a cigarette, lay it on a cadaver, uh, walk away, have a leisurely lunch, and come back and find a pile of dry, desiccated powder uh, inside the retort, brush it out, put it in an urn, and give it to the next of kin. They don't do that because they can't do that. Mm. Um, they're businessmen. Um, the Wick theory we have tried in the early days of our research into the subject, we, we tried the Wick theory ourselves to see if, you know, does it work? If it works, then there's nothing particularly mysterious about spontaneous human combustion, and we'll find something else to investigate. Um, we have never succeeded in getting the Wick effect to work. And everyone to whom we've spoken to, and this includes dozens of crematorium owners and operators, they too cannot get it to work. So the mystery remains. So when you say you tried it, did you try it on uh, cadavers or animals, or or what did you try it with? What we did um, was take uh, ham shanks, um, pork bones very similarly to human tissue, so it's a good stand-in for this. We did not... uh, use human cadavers, don't have access to those, though we've spoken to crematorium operators who clearly do. And they get the same results that we get, um, pretty much. Um, we would wrap our ham shank um, in, in flannel, um, light it externally, and wait to see what happens. 
Uh, it was once claimed that victims of, al- of, of spontaneous human combustion were always elderly, always female, always sedentary, and always alcoholics. So we took another sample of ham shank, soaked mm-hmm. it in a marinade of whiskey, brandy, and vodka for an entire year. Believe us, this ham shank was saturated alcohol- with alcohol. Wrapped it in flannel, lit it, and after an hour, this is an experiment that we did uh, on camera for the BBC uh, program in 1999 about the subject. At the end of the hour, with an unlimited supply of oxygen and a light breeze to fuel the ignition process, 99% of the ham shank was still intact. Wow. Um, that's as close as we've been able to come. There was a scientist uh, a year or two ago, Brian Ford, in the UK, who claimed that the body generates an abnormal amount of acetone. Acetone is a highly flammable chemical. And his theory to explain SHC was that the body creates acetone of such enormous levels that once ignited externally, you know, we've got Dr. Bentley or Mary Reeser. The problem we found with his experiment when we, when we attempted to replicate it, because, you know, we're scientists, we'll see if it works for us too. Um, it didn't work for us because in Brian Ford's experiments, he, he supersaturated his fatty tissue um, with acetone, well, sure, it's going to burn. Acetone is a highly flammable chemical. Um, but when you get down to realistic levels that the human body can survive, um, you're looking at a solution of acetone that we believe cannot be above 7 to, seven to 8%, not 100%. At, at those levels, acetone will not self-sustain a, a combustion in a, in a ham shank sample, which is the experiment that we conducted. That being said, uh, alcohol was the route that I was going to go next as far as, uh, you know, uh, the chemistry angle of, of all that. And particularly, like you said, whiskey and maybe vodka or, or other ke- chemicals you can make a, uh, a Molotov cocktail out of or whatever. The, the, uh, particularly flammable versions of, of alcohol versus beer or something else. So uh, what is the percentage uh, as far as in, in the cases that it, does it show that people were drinking like hard liquors and stuff like that as far as uh, what's the percentage? Uh, we're going to make a guess at that because we don't believe, at least we can't recall having done uh, a data analysis of how many of the victims in our database were known to be alcoholics. Our guess, and this is just a really crude guess, it's probably about 30, 35% were said to be alcoholics. Okay. Which seems um, kind, of, uh, kind of high, actually. So Yeah. yeah. Um most of the victims in the database are elderly, uh, going back to the, the parameters that the, the medical community in the 17 and early 1800s, you know, posited as always having to be present. Uh, most of the victims are elderly, and, and that doesn't surprise us. As, as the body chronologically ages, you know, biological processes tend to break down, and, and you can expect more aberrant things to happen to the body's physiology. As to all the victims having been uh female and alcoholics and sedentary, that is clearly not supportable. Uh, Our database of more than 500 cases now that fit the concept of SHC, 50% are female, 47% are male, 3% history just does does not tell us the gender. Wow. And so uh, you mentioned acetone. What what part of the body would you find uh, acetone or what part of the body did you you find acetone or or levels of that? Um, Where, Where would it be generated? Yeah. Um, Brian Ford, we believe, you know, posits that, that at the cellular level throughout the body, acetone could be generated. Um, but, but as we found, you, you can't, the body can't generate 100% concentration acetone. It just, you know, the, the okay. person would, would die long before that could conceivably happen. Um, and plus, the, 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 the experiment that he did, he, he, he took a sliver of fat, wrapped it in, clo- in basically cheesecloth, um, and, and torched it. Um, the body is not 100% fat. Um, those who, who um, in fact, uh, we mentioned John DeHaan earlier as one of the proponents of, of the Wick theory and one of the prime naysayers of spontaneous human combustion. In one of the experiments that he conducted for television to prove the Wick theory explains away spontaneous human combustion, he took a fistful of candles, wrapped it in, in flannel, and, and lit it. Well, anybody who believes that the human body consists of 100% candle wax is a fool and uninformed. <laughs> um, it's bad science. Um, a man of his reputation should never have conducted that experiment for television and in, in for any other venue. Uh, it just speaks to, in our view, the, the desperation in which the naysayers of SpawnCom will go in order to 
not have to face the facts and the evidence that, that we've amassed in our decades of research. It's always amazed me, Larry, in, in many different subjects that we cover on this show, the debunkers, they, they, they will, I love that you mentioned bad science because they always use bad science <laughs> to, to, to debunk you know, people who are doing real science and real research. It, 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 and it happens on so many different levels, so many different subjects. Uh, so, so I'll give you time to respond to that, Scotty Hare, if, if you have anything for, for Larry. I, I, like, I have a bunch of things going through my head. Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, you know I, I go back to my paranormal roots and stuff it have have there been any have there been any cases where you have heard anything about through family connections or anything about uh any kind of paranormal activity within the houses or maybe alien abduction yeah one of avenue to pursue um we have a chapter in our in a blaze that that looks at the interface between spontaneous combustion fires, particularly involving human beings, and alien intervention. Um, we do believe there's a plausible causative linkage there. Um, certainly does not apply to all the cases, and we, God knows, we want to emphasize that, does not apply to all the cases. Um, other than that, uh, the, the, the field, the database is wide open to consider almost anything at this point. Um, I've got a... Sorry. Ahead, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I question just occurred to me here when I'm listening to all of this. And uh, kind of going back to uh, kind of um, before these, these people, you know, burst into flames and everything... Has there been any reports of, say, family members or uh, friends, somebody close to them, uh, noticing anything unusual, some symptoms perhaps that might might have uh, led to this? You know, uh, Truth had mentioned a, a sweet smell, for example. Was there there anything that that they might have looked back later and said, "Oh, you know something? There was you know this this one thing here that uh, it was just really unusual." about them right another superb question you guys are brilliant um we wish we had an answer for you sadly we do not um it is in, it has been incredibly difficult for us to identify these cases and to conduct proper research in so many of them uh in part because the the first responders are reluctant if not downright opposed to revealing the two aspects of the case and in the in the more recent cases where we have had the opportunity to meet with the next of kin to look for information precisely along the lines that you're asking about, was there a family history? Was there any precursor symptoms? Was there a, a known medical condition that might translate into thermal phenomena? The family members have not been cooperative. Um, that happened in the Van Zandt case in Oklahoma in 2013. Uh, it's happened to cases here in Harrisburg um, where we had made appointments with the next of kin, and uh, one one of the relatives was willing to sit down and meet with us, but another member of the family was adamantly opposed to having that happen, and, and we were consequently thwarted from our efforts to obtain that kind of crucial information. Hey, Larry. Look Actually, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Larry, Larry, real quick, man. Uh, when we hit this, we got a little bit of time before this break, but when we hit this next break, it's such a short se segment, and we have to say a very quick goodbye to you when we come back from this break. Let everyone know how to get in touch with you and fire out all your information. This has been beyond my expectation, an incredible interview with you tonight, man. Thank you, sir. Yeah, getting in touch with us is pretty easy. The website is parascience, P-A-R-A-Science dot com. Not a great website, but at least it will get you in touch with us. The The best email address to use for this specific subject is real simple, shchappens at gmail. As you kindly mentioned earlier, the book, A Blaze, is available through Amazon. Um, you can order it through Amazon. Um, we do sign all copies um, generically that come through Amazon. If you order directly from us through, through the website link, uh, we can personalize that inscription to anybody who wants to learn more about the phenomenon. The book is thick. It's almost 500 pages. We've been told it looks like it's and reads like a Stephen King novel. The difference is this is not fiction. 
This is research that's based on decades of delving into lost medical records, tombs, first-hand interviews with first responders, uh, photographs that have never before been published until a blaze was put onto the market. Um, we think it's a fascinating study of an, of an extraordinarily fascinating subject. Wow. So before we hit this break, obviously, you, you, during your investigation, you have to rule out whether or not uh, these are cases of SHC or there's something else. And so that means that there are, are particular criteria. So before we go into break, can you break down what, what are the necessary uh, requirements for it to even be considered uh, an SHC case? Uh, first would be the, the strength of the evidence at the fire scene or the testimony from the victim if it's a survivor or witness case. Um, in, in the classic cases of, of fatal SHC, we look for localized fire damage. We look for evidence of what appears to have been a high temperature, perhaps 2,500 to 2,000 degree temperature, and yet we're surrounding combustibles that have ignition points at a few hundred degrees Fahrenheit or left intact and undamaged. Mm. We look for evidence of sweet aroma um, or no odor. Um, that would tend to rule out a, a normal conventional fatal fire. Um, we look for geographic location. We look for environmental conditions. Was there, you know, electrical activity outside the, the fire scene at the time that could provide an external cause? Um, things along that line. And just look for as much information as we can conceivably glean from all probable, credible sources. Larry, once again, uh, with with your permission, I will get you in touch with Scott Hare, and he, he shall get you on his show, okay? That's fine. That sounds good. Um, once again, I want to thank you so much. We, we have to hit a, a, a real quick plug here, but I want to thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. You have, once again, beyond my expectations. I, I knew you were going to be a great guest. Everyone else was looking at me sideways. <laughs> really? We're, we're going to talk about spontaneous human combustion? No, but uh, everyone has come with great questions, and it's been a great show with you. So I want to thank you so much, and I want to get you on again. We've enjoyed it, too. Great questions. We, we concur with that. You know, we, we've, we've been taught over the years to be prepared to expect the unexpected. And as one state arson investigator told us, I consider every fire to be unconventional. We don't quibble that. It's just that some fires are more unconventional than most. And when you get into classic SHC fire scenes, you're at the epitome of the unconventional fire scene. And we just ask for people to be open-minded and inquisitive and ask good questions like you folks have done tonight. And someday we're all going to find answers to this mystery. Definitely. Well, you know, fire was a conventional thing. It wouldn't be a big deal. So so I definitely appreciate uh, you coming on and, uh, and uh, breaking it down for us forensically and everything else. So thank you so much. You're most welcome. Thank you so much, Larry, and I'll get you in touch with Scott. Best to you all and to your listeners. All right. That's Larry Arnold, everyone. Great guest right there.